My name is Brian Glass. I'm doing a talk which you all are in here for, for better or worse, um, moving forward by looking back. So I want to talk a little bit about how we've done data collection and analysis at OWASP and then try to essentially rally the troops. I need more people to do more of this. Um, and so, but I'll give you a little bit of a background. I've been playing with a bunch of different things. So OWASP top 10 since 2017. OWASP SAM since 2012, somewhere in that range. Uh, OWASP SAM benchmark, and then all we have coming up OWASP David. And I'll explain what David is. But a few different companies I've worked at over the years. Um, currently, I am teaching. Um, I'm the chair and assistant professor of computer science at small private union university. So obligatory AI integration. So AI is super popular now, so I decided I needed AI as part of my talk. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting. I like using it against itself, and I do this with the students all the time. And I made AI. It's give me, I said, um, give me an image that represents data. Give it some beautifully vague thing that it doesn't really know what to do with. Because I'm really curious to see in its whole massive collection of tokens and everything, what does it think data is? So I got it to try and describe an image, and then I gave it back its own description and said, go make me this image. And AI is iffy so far about trying to actually pull this off. Um, if you want something mildly disturbing, ask it to show you the balance between security and privacy and the stuff that it pulls up that it thinks are associated, the icons and the images that it associates with privacy versus security is pretty interesting. But so back in the starting some of the history, um, I got pulled into the OWASP Top 10 for 2017. So the OWASP Top 10 had been built for a number of years based on industry discussions, um, interests, and it's kind of not really data driven at all. Um, we got, then it ended up having a little bit of controversy. I'm not going to dredge all of that back up. Um, got a little bit of a reset in 2017. So we had a data call, um, first open public data call for the OWASP Top 10 that we had for 2017. We ended up with 114,000 applications in that data call. And we were like amazed. That was awesome. Things that we learned in that data call. Um, humans are better at finding stuff. Shocking, really, you know? Because um, tools only know what they can, what you tell them to look for. They'll look for them all day long. They will happily hunt for them all day long, but they know nothing more than what you tell them to look for. So tools end up being limited. Um, tools can scale. Humans don't. Um, we were absolutely not looking for everything. But one of the biggest things that came out of this in terms of a lesson learned is when we looked at the data and we finally had it at scale, we decided that we couldn't, do in, we couldn't do frequency. So frequency was more of the how many findings do you have of a particular vulnerability type. So for instance, I ran some early metrics and the initial data that we had gotten with the 2017 data when we looked at top 10 by prevalence, you have this giant blue Pac-Man. I probably should have made it yellow, but you know, whatever, it's blue. Um, 1.9 million cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in the data set. It was like 85% of everything. It was insane. So this is why for a long time OWASP top 10 cross-site scripting was near the top for the longest time, because frequency-wise, it's always going to be there. It's one of the easiest things to find, and it's also one of the easiest things to inadvertently create. So we have a lot of them. Um, humans, on the other hand, were great. They would find misconfigurations. They'd find authentication vulnerabilities, information leakage. So we had to figure out some way to compare these two. You can't compare them on raw numbers. Your highest on the human side was 8,300. And the highest on the tool side was 1.9 million. They're just not really comparable. So we went to incidence rate. So incidence rate, we cared more about what was in how many times, not how many times you found it, but whether or not you found it in the first place. So if you found cross-site scripting in an application, you would get one. 
You don't get 10,000, you don't get 8,000, you get a one, and that's it. I just care about how many apps actually exhibited this problem. I don't really care if it's a systemic problem or a single oops from a developer, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to see how widespread, how often do certain vulnerabilities show up in different applications. And for the first time, all of a sudden, we started dethroning cross-site scripting. And so this was from some of the stuff from the 2017, but we still had a problem where we didn't know how many apps were tested. We knew how many apps that we found certain vulnerabilities in, but nobody had captured how many apps had actually been tested. So we had to basically guess. We basically picked whatever was the highest, inc highest incidence rate or the highest count of something, and we said, well, that must have been however many apps you tested. It wasn't accurate, but it was close. Um, we didn't know because nobody told us, or were these new or retests? Because a lot of times you'll get the data from somebody and they will just do a dump from the contributors. And if you're a contributor, thank you so much. Um, but sometimes we just wouldn't know. We wouldn't know, are we seeing the same app multiple times? Or is this a new app or a new test? Um, we have no idea on overlap between contributors. So this, this isn't as big of a deal. I'm not as worried about this. Um, but if you change vendors in a year, there's no unique app ID that says, hey, by the way, this app in this vendor's data set is the same as this app in this vendor's data set. Or you have multiple vendors. I can't tell the difference. We don't get that. I don't want that level of detail, but it also means I don't have that level of detail in the data. So one of the other things that we did um, between incidence rate and frequency is we also ran a survey. Because we determined that, hey, if we're collecting data for the OWASP top 10, that um, that data is anywhere between one and three years old, maybe a couple months, anyway from now to three years back. Right? So this is stuff that's happened in the past. So we realized that we really needed another way to understand what might we not have in the data. So the data from the, that were submitted to us um, didn't have a complete picture in it. So we decided, all right, let's put together a survey. When we put together a survey, we basically took everything that had always been on the cusp of being in the top 10. And we collected all these different CWEs, and we said, all right, people, we trust you not to game the system. Um, so we had a few protections in place to make sure people weren't gaming the system. And so far, nobody has, which has been nice. Please don't do it for 2024. I, I don't want to have to deal with the overhead of cleaning up bots voting. Um, but we, what we did is we said, hey, tell us what you think is important that might not be in the data. And so might not be found in the tool, might have such a low finding rate, but it's up and coming, it's serious. And so our first time through, we had uh, exposure of privacy or private information. We had cryptographic failures, uh, deserialization. But one of the things that we noticed coming up was we had SSRF. We had server-side request forgery coming up. And so I actually, when I was going through old slides, I found the note that said, keep an eye on this one. And so we found out in the survey for 2021 that it, we were actually right. We watched it come up and climb into prevalence. Um, but this way, this allows humans to tell us what's going on. Because we won't, humans won't come out in that testing stuff. It takes a while, right? So a human finds a new vulnerability, finds a new way of testing something. It takes a while for that test to propagate into the tooling. You build the tool, you build the test, that test happens, and then that test very slowly gets spread across multiple things. It might take you two years from actually creating a new test to where you have enough where your apps are fully tested. So we come in the 2021 top 10, and we find that, again, we're looking at incidence rate, not frequency, but we change something else. And so for 2017, we were still operating under the previous co data collection model. So they had asked for approximately 30 CWEs. So if you've ever played with CWEs, you know there's over 1,000 of them total. Most of them may never see the light of day, but they exist because in theory that is an actual problem. We just haven't really seen it manifest itself yet. But instead of prescripting or limiting and only asking for 30 CWEs, we said, 
basically bring out your dead. Give us all the CWEs. We don't care, you know, whatever you map them to, just map them. And that's an interesting challenge in itself is the majority of the people who contribute, that's not part of their normal thing. They're not saving the data with CWEs associated with their findings. And so that becomes another challenge in here is that is trying to get the data, trying to get accuracy. And it's different interpretations of these CWEs. Now, if you get into it, and, and we got into, uh, when we were trying to categorize and group things in the 2021 top 10, we spent probably three months moving stuff around. Because depending on the day, I could put this CWE in this type of category, or this CWE in that type of category. Because believe it or not, application security is complicated. And it's squishy. And it's not nice. And it doesn't follow nice, clean lines. And so we ended up in 2021, we had almost 400 CWEs in the data, which was insane. I wasn't expecting this, but we had a massive explosion. Um, all we had asked for in 2021 is like, we need to know the year because we're trying to keep the year separate. Um, that way we have also an idea of how things aged over time. Um, what CWE, what population was tested? So we needed to know, hey, how many applications did you actually test in this point period of time? So that way we could say, um, of these applications, we, we know we can calculate the incidence rate more accurately. We know what the total population is, which you need to know for an incidence rate. And then you know how many apps exhibited at least one entry. So remember, we're not actually hunting for systemic issues. We're looking for, does, did this ever happen in this application? So we also decided to change up or move the bar a little bit more in the top 10. So the image on the right, um, I started drawing and I pulled together and I realized that the top 10 in 2017 had some interesting characteristics in terms of um, a lot of types or a lot of the risk categories manifested themselves in other ways as well. So for instance, um, broken access control. So misconfiguration can result in broken access control. Or sensitive data exposure can, can result in a cryptographic failure. Um, so it was more of the symptom versus the root cause. And unfortunately, and I don't have a way to fix this, CWEs have both sim symptom CWEs and they have root cause CWEs. So my favorite I say favorite loosely, CWE 200 is like sensitive data exposure. That's not a flaw. That is the result of a flaw. And so when people would assign CWEs to findings, they would be like, oh, well, this re results in a sensitive data exposure, and I get a ton of 200 findings. I'm like, yes, but what went wrong? Why did you get sensitive data exposure? And so we had all of these relationships where injection could be XXE, injection could get into insecurity serialization. Um, all of these things could be the result of using known vulnerable components. So then we also, in 2021, um, we said, what would happen, just for fun, if we said each finding was a single CWE? And if we did, based on the contributed data, your number one would have been reachable assertion. Super useful for everybody, right? I mean, divide by zero, insufficient transport layer encryption, click jacking, known vulns, that's actually in there twice. I think there's two different CWEs that actually map to known vulns. Um, so this never saw the light of day because trying to create the OS top 10 just purely mathematically off of CWEs was not a good idea. So what do we do with it? So in the CWEs that was brought in by multiple organizations, only of the 13 contributors, only one CWE is actually in all of them. Of course, it's our good friend 79, which is cross-site scripting, of course, because it's about the easiest thing you can find in an app at this point. 
Um, 200, again, my good friend 200, that is just my sensitive data exposure. It's a catch-all bucket where you're not entirely sure what happened, but we're just going to say, hey, bad things happened. Um, 327, which is one of the cryptos. I think 352 is as well. Um, 89 SQL injection. But over 75% of the CWEs were brought in by three or fewer organizations. So we have a... Um, not discrepancy. We don't really agree on how to assign CWEs to things. Everybody has their own idea. And so that makes it a real pain to deal with this data. But in 2021, we ended up with over half a million applications worth of data. Like we were blown away. From 2017, where we had 115,000, and now all of a sudden in 2021, <coughs> we have. 515,000 apps. And we even excluded the retests because we actually got people to tell us, is this a new test or a retest? And so all of that got flagged in the data. But again, data was looking in the past, so we had the survey again. Um, we generally ran by the rule stability is good, so we didn't change things for the sake of changing things in the top 10. So if something was six or seven and we kind of, we understand that the OS top 10 um, drives an entire industry. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people hours that are put into building things around the OS top 10. It's not something we take trivially. It's not something we take lightly. It drives what you take for training in the next year is driven by what we put in the top 10. But I wish somebody would come across something better because the top 10 is not supposed to be a baseline and it's created, it's been set as a baseline at this point. Um, so we use it to try what we can do because it's uh, technically an awareness document. So we have some freedom in there. Um, we want to raise the minimum bar. We want to drive the right behavior. And one of the things we're trying to drive is root cause over symptom. So that's part of the reason why in the 2021 top 10, number four is insecure design. Because you don't, f you find that, but that's the root cause when you find other things. There's a whole host of CWEs that at the end of the day, the root cause was you did not design this well. You did not design a control, so missing authentication. If you're straight up missing it, that's an insecure design problem. You didn't actually design your app to have that kind of control in it. So then we also found where now that we know what percentage of the population were tested, and we have this larger data set, we ended up with some really interesting scenarios. Like 552 is files or directories accessible to external parties, right? So S3 bucket kind of problem. Had a ridiculously high incidence rate. 56% of the applications tested it showed up in. Now the interesting thing is, so you're like, oh, okay, so this should be high, except the population had 515,000 apps in it, and only 11,000 of those apps were ever tested for the CWE. Or at least that's what they told us. So we have an overall incidence rate of only 1.2%. Now what would happen if we tested the other 504,000 apps for this? Would we find every, the same thing at a 56% incidence rate? Probably not, but we don't know. And so that's where we wanted, so that was a level of assurance or lack of assurance. And so what we wanted is we wanted to find things where we, part of the calculations for the top 10 in terms of the importance of things and the risk was trying to find things that were tested a lot. And so this wasn't a common test. I think really 552 only came out of like three vendors or three submitters of the 13. Um, so we ended up with coverage that we calculated into it. So we needed impact, right? So we all know risk is likelihood times impact. And so for 2017, our impact was exploit detectability and tech impact. And that was really four people. One of them was in a car in the middle of Ohio spending four hours trying to say, hey, what do you think the impact of this particular category is? And so in 2021, we said, all right, let's not just do half data. Let's try to do all data. So how can we come up with an impact 
for the data that we actually have. We have all of these CWEs. How do we actually get impact for data? So we went to look for CVSS. I have a love-hate relationship with CVSS. I love that there's data that exists. I think it's still flawed. Um, CVSS 4, we'll see. Um, I'll use the term cautious optimism. 2 and 3 are messed up. If you look at the distribution of CVSS scores, there's no way that's accurate. We're missing things. And there are also, it's kind of confusing for some people. It doesn't really line up. Um, but it's what we had. It was data that we had so that we tried to use it the best we could. So we took weighted CVs, CVSS 2 and 3 scores for CWEs. So we took all of the CVE findings. So thank you to Dependency Check. Um, exported the database, found that we could cross map 241 CWEs. So a lot of CVEs don't have a CWE associated with them. So I can't do anything with that. I do appreciate it when somebody does associate a CWE with a CVE, that helps immensely. So some of our CVEs didn't have a CVSS subscore to leverage. Um, one, we'll never get it, vulnerable components. You will never have a CW, CVE that's published that is mapped to a CWE of a vulnerable component because that wasn't what actually broke. What broke was whatever was broken inside the vulnerable component, potentially, but you'll never actually get the CWE mapped, that vulnerable component CWE mapped. So of the data we had, again, my nemesis cross-site scripting shows up. Also why it's part of the SANS and MITRE top 25 all of the time, because it's based on frequency. So it shows up there all the time. But we had a bunch of other, we had a bunch of no info, and then we worked our way down the line. We got a cross -size, or a SQL injection here and our good friend, sensitive data exposure. So then we also learned, because we asked um, the data, the people who submitted data, we also asked them, try to tell us what type of tool you used. And not everybody did, but some people did. Um, so we learned, and, and it was basically more of a confirmation, we learned that insufficient entropy, you will never find in an IAST or a DAST. That is only a static analysis thing. That CWE will never show up out of the other types of tooling. Same with clickjacking. Clickjacking, you will really only ever find with a DAST. Um, to be honest, if you look at like missing session cookies, HTTP flags, and all of secure flags and all of that, don't ever try to find those with a static analysis tool because there's a dozen places you could set that. And if you look for it in code and you flag it that it's not there, you're gonna be chasing something for a while. It's super annoying. So you only know whether or not that's there is when that data comes back and you get a response back from your request when you're actually doing dynamic testing whether that'll ever show up. SQL injection was kind of interesting. We have a lot of SAS records. But the other thing I don't know I asked them for this and I got almost none of it, was how verified were the findings in the data? Is it just raw data spit out from all of the original scans? Is it tailored? Is it tuned? Has it been verified? Um, which is why I love it when we get bug crowd um, data or hacker one data, because somebody paid for it, which means it's the highest level of verification I can get. Somebody actually paid out for that, so I know that stuff is real. There's just not, the volume's not there compared to a lot of the tools. So top 10 survey, we were right. Server-side request forgery, SSRF showed up. Um, it's the only in the top 10, it's the only one to be a single CWE. And the reason for that was we put it in the survey. And it came out of the survey and we said, you know what, we committed to doing this. And so you have a single CWE in there. <coughs> Some of these others, um, insufficient logging and monitoring, um, protected storage of credentials, um, they're in some of the data. But again, this is the interesting thing with running the survey is the data, the incidence rate and the testing data did not show SSRF was a problem. But if you ask the people, SSRF was a big problem. 
And so like, how do you reconcile that? And so the best we could do is say, look, if the people said it's a real problem, then it's probably a problem. But what, we, what we're not doing is we're not testing for it correctly. And so part of the things, because we're an awareness document, now we can bring awareness to SSRF. I fully expect to see more SSRF in the data for the 2024 because we have write up uh, from the top 10 <coughs> that, that tells how to help searching for it, how to help finding it. Um, so hopefully that shows up. But if we could, if you're gonna store vulnerability data, please put a CWE reference on it. It would make life so much easier. Then you can contribute very easily and I get more data for the top 10. Tell me if it's a new or a retest. Tell me what year it was done. Um, I would love to see language or framework. Because what I really want to do is I really want the data that we can collect for the top 10. Like, I don't think there is any other single data set that has over half a million applications in it. Because it's the collection of multiple medium, large, small vendors and the data that they've collected over that time. Nobody's state of AppSec, state of testing, state of SAS, state of DAS, state of IAST, they're all individual companies. They have a little narrow slice. This is the biggest collection that we have so far. I'm hoping that we, this, this time around we get over half a million. If you can do some level of severity, that would be fascinating um, because that is so subjective to the environment. There's so many different compensating controls. There's different things going on. Um, and if you don't, so be it. Um, how many people know CWSS exists? Two, three. <laughs> So CWSS is like CVSS's big cousin. Um, we need to do more about it, but there aren't really many calculators for it and people don't really use it. I think it's actually more valuable than CVSS. We just haven't had to push for it. Um, and tell me if it's verified. I would dearly love to know if this is actually verified findings and not just something the tool puts out. Um, when you map CWEs, please don't map to a category. Category is a super abstract grouping of a bunch of others. It kind of messes things up. Um, try to use root cause as much as possible. There's a lot of security outside of code. So um, most of the stuff we see is essentially implementation testing. So it's static, dynamic. Um, I, what's the I? I want to say intrinsic, but it's not. It's interactive. Okay. We've changed it a few times. I've seen a few different eyes, but all right, interactive. So all of that testing is of code, but there's more data outside of that code testing. Um, things I'm, I'm working on trying to do, get data related to architecture, trying to score architecture in terms of how do you have a good quality or secure architecture. Um, but beyond that too is the other project that I spend a ton of time on on data, is in, and that's SAM Benchmark. So one of the things we're trying to do is um, similar to the top 10, trying to bring to light all of these different vulnerabilities and what you should pay attention to and where risks are, what's more prevalent or not. Um, within SAM, so if you don't know, SAM is the Software Assurance Maturity Model. So this is soup to nuts, whatever analogy you want to do, start to finish, um, how you run a secure development program or secure software program. And so um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to collect that kind of data. So people go through SAM assessments. Uh, there's five different functions that goes from governance to design to implementation to verification to operations. And so it is SDLC plus. You also get governance and operations on it. Um, we're trying to get companies to come and say, hey, we did a SAM assessment. Here's our score. What's our data? Can other people tell? So the number one question we get with Sam is, how do I compare? And that's part of the reason why, uh, do you all know what BSIM is? If I'm assuming you've heard of BSIM by now. So BSIM has been great for digital now synopsis um, because they were able to actually tell people this is where you compare. This is how we match. But BSIM is more of an exclusive club so if you look at the average size of the software security group in BSIMs, last time I looked, it was like 22. 
I used to run FedEx's AppSec security program. We had six. I can't fathom having 22 people in my software security group. That would be phenomenal, but I can't imagine how big I am to be able to get that. And so if that's the average size, that's a very slanted, right-tailed data set in terms of what we're looking at. So when you compare yourself against them, be careful, because those are all the people that have really large budgets and high risk, and whether or not you want to compare against them is another question. But that's where SAM Benchmark's trying to come in. We're trying to be more of the holistic, get you from a 50-person company to a Fortune 50 company. You can cover the whole range. Um, we're trying to help organizations learn from each other because there's no other data set like this today, because I'll say that because I don't think BSIMS is actually representative of the industries. They are of slices of different industries, but not to the scale that Sam could actually do it. So we can kind of compare, because um, so BSIM, the funny thing with BSIM is that they actually forked off of Sam in the very early days. And so the similarities, <coughs> similarities between the categories or the business functions were striking. Um, so you have strategy and metrics and strategy and metrics and policy and compliance and compliance and policy. Uh, big difference right there, right? So the interesting thing is, is if you read through the detailed questions, like how BSIM actually asks questions versus how SAM asks questions, we've diverged a long ways. The categories still say the same thing, but we're not asking the same questions. So the scores are only comparable at a super high level. SAM has also, um, SAM has changed to where we had four business functions. And you can kind of see this in BSIMS. So you can go from security features um, and design, standards and requirements, architecture analysis, code review, security testing. What's not in the middle here? I went from design to testing. There's no development. So it just skips over. So when SAM was originally built, and this is what BSIM was modeled after as well, you did all of these things, then you wrote code. And then you did all of this testing. Well, the whole you just wrote code in Waterfall has blown up through Agile and then into DevOps and all of this other stuff. So SAM decided that, hey, we're missing this whole chunk. And so we now have an implementation chunk. So now we have secure build, secure deployment, defect, defect management. So we're now looking at, hey, it's a whole lot goes on instead of just code. So now there's 15 categories in SAM and 12 in BSIM. Now BSIM may expand at some point as well, but I'm not quite sure. So what we're trying to do <coughs> is we're trying to compare like what are low scores, what are median scores, what are high scores for different organizations? We're aggregating the scoring all the way from the individual questions in SAM through the streams, the security activities, um, all the way up to business function. And then we're trying to slice the metadata by size, region, industry, that kind of thing. So people get nervous when you put out there, this is how mature my company is. Um, they seem to think they're gonna get hacked from it, which, I kind of doubt. Um, I get it if you accidentally publish, hey, this part of my code has a SQL injection in it, right? There, there's decent risk to that. That's why we don't generally share those kinds of reports. But if you get a 1.32 on secure deployment, as an attacker, is that enough information to really do something with? I'd argue no, but I have not won that battle with everybody yet. So that's why I don't have as much data in SAM yet. But the idea is, is that you could go and say, hey, I'm part of the financial fintech. Um, I work in the European region, and this is my size. What are my comparable? Who can I compare against? Because we do that, right? We're trained as for the executives that they want dashboards and they need comparisons. You need to compare against somebody else because I need to know how well I'm doing. And I need to know, do I need to fight for more? Do I need to fight for a larger budget? So we updated the SAM toolbox. Has anybody in here used SAM? Just curious. One, two, three, four. Awesome. Um, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. 
um, biased, but also highly recommend it. Um, we updated the toolkit at this point. So now we have um, an organization for that you can be able to upload. Um, I'm not as crazy about OneDrive folder for de deposit, but Azure is being a pain in terms of there's no drop, like Dropbox level. Um, but we can consume that data within minutes into the Azure Data Factory. And then we have a database that we just process it, um, store it. Um, right now we're looking at Tableau for some of the initial visualizations. And so you can look <coughs> right now of the data set that's in there. You can get an idea of where people are at. So this is just the overall. Um, the idea is, is to essentially put slicers into it and be able to let people say, hey, how do I compare this? So the question then becomes, where do we go from here? So I've been working on all of this data for the top 10 and all of this data for Sam. And I was like, you know what? I would bet you there's some other projects that also use data, want to use data, not sure where to take data. So decided to create something for that. So we have David. So the data analysis, visualization, and ingestion domain. Yes, domain's a weird word there, but it spells David. So that's all that mattered. Um, so the idea is, is we're trying to create an OWASP project. So we want to be able to have it at a larger scale so that any of the OWASP projects who want to be able to contribute data, want to be able to visualize data, want to be able to say, hey, I am doing good, I am improving things, and I can show you how. And so the top 10 can do it with data, Sam can do it with data, and I believe there are other OWASP projects that can do that. So if you're part of a project that has any interest in this, trying to get data out to visualize what's going on in your project, what benefits you're seeing in your project, um, or if you're interested in actually being part of that team where you say, hey, I want to contribute time to this because I think it's actually a very good thing to do. This is one of the things to me that should be what OWASP is about, right? So OWASP should be around here trying to make things better. That's the whole point, right? We're trying to improve the industry. And so one of the things we can do is we can build data out to show where we're making those improvements in the industry. So maybe it's the core rule set within the Amazon WAF. Maybe we can get some of that data. Um, who knows? I mean, it's pretty broad. <coughs> <laughs> Maybe we can get some data out of Zap, um, start showing, giving a platform where people can actually manage data and show what good they're doing. So finishing up, if you want to be able to contribute SAM data, um, please contribute SAM data. Everyone just seems to come ask and say, hey, how do I compare? But I don't want to give you my data. And so to be able to compare, people have to contribute data. It's the same thing with the top 10. Please contribute data. We're about to open the data call for the 2024 top 10. Um, be able to contribute data, because then we can compare. We can see what's going on. Um, and then if you want to contribute to David in any way, please let me know. I would love to have data projects to show up. Um, Right now, most of the infrastructure is essentially an Azure Data Factory. It's far more capable than I'm using it for right now. Um, SAM and top 10 data is relative simplistic data, um, and it's not high volume, high frequency. So top 10 data shows up every three or, three or so years. SAM data shows up, but it's not like, we're not talking about a million transactions per second kind of thing. SAM data shows up in little blobs. But, all right. That's what I had. Any, any questions? Thoughts? Lunch? <laughs> <laughs> I get the slot between here and lunch. So. On. OK. There you yeah, go. There you go. So earlier in the slides, you had um, uh, some of the metrics pulled. And so we had things like cross-site scripting and some of the stuff that we've always had. So in your opinion, what do you think 
is the root cause of that. Like, Cross- what, yeah, is it like why are we still getting this wrong? Generally, for me, if if you still get cross-site scripting, then that language or framework hasn't solved it for you. That's really the only way we're going to solve these is if we can get the people who are managing the languages and the frameworks to make it hard to do it. Right now, there's too many out there where it's very easy to create cross-site scripting. That's why it's so prevalent. It's stupid easy to accidentally create it. Um, there's some languages and frameworks where cross-site scripting is almost non-existent. And that's because the way they built the model and the way they built that st- structure, you, it's almost impossible to create that. There's some languages where it's almost impossible to create SQL injection, and some not. And so if we're going to solve those, then we have to do it at the root, at the core. And that's part of the reason why I went to work for Microsoft when I did, because I wanted to see the, the home of SDL, the home of .NET, the home of all of that. How are they fixing it? And they're trying to fix it at the framework and the language level. All right, anything else? All right. Well, you all enjoy lunch. Thank you.